Greetings. As I deliver this talk, the Americans and the British are again bombing another country. This time it is Yemen, one of the poorest of countries in the entire world. The military action being taken by the American and the British establishments against the impoverished people of Yemen has been approved by neither Congress, nor the Houses of Parliament, nor the United Nations Security Council. Indeed, the American and the British establishments did not even consult Congress or the Houses of Parliament or the United Nations Security Council. Accordingly, and as is so often the case with Washington and London, the actions of the American and the British establishment are unilateral, hence illegal under international law. Washington and London's utter contempt and disregard for their own parliaments and the United Nations Security Council, and with this, the United Nations Charter, is a reminder of the grotesque illusion which the American and the British ruling elites so arrogantly, unashamedly, and sickeningly project about themselves, namely, that they are the guardians of democracy and international law. Whilst it is only now that both the American and British publics are speaking the word Yemen, having ever so predictably absorbed the crude propaganda being put out about the Arab country by American and British mainstream media outlets, what ordinary Americans and Britons are completely ignorant about is that America and Britain have been at war with Yemen for nine years now. And as a result, Washington and London have caused the deaths of nearly 400,000 Yemeni civilians and given rise to the greatest humanitarian catastrophe that the world, that the world has experienced in contemporary times. Suffice to say, that America and Britain's nine-year war of aggression against Yemen is one of the most heinous cases of crimes against humanity in history. Now, when, why, and how did America and Britain's war of aggression against the Yemeni people come about? I will shortly tell you, but hear these words first of all, the true story concerning Yemen and the Houthis is far, far bigger than the simplistic story currently being told by American and British politicians and mainstream journalists. And as I previous, previously said, the Americans and the British have been at war with Yemen for nearly a decade. Hence, they have not only become involved in Yemen in the last week or so. A blood-soaked secret, though not so much of a secret to those of us who are enlightened and have the capacity to think both independently and critically, and who are not hooked to Western mainstream media. With that said, I will now provide you with the full and real story concerning Yemen and the Houthis. In September of 2014, a popular uprising in Yemen, led by the Ansarallah movement, or more, or more commonly known as the Houthi movement, took control of the Yemeni capital, Sana'a, causing the then president, Abdrabu Mansur Hadi, a much hated pro-Western puppet, to flee to the southern port city of Aden. Not wanting to lose momentum, the military wing of the Houthi movement, along with elements of the Yemeni armed forces, pursued Hadi to Aden, which they captured in March of 2015. On the day that the Houthis and other forces were on the, outset, on the outskirts of Aden, Hadi fled to Saudi Arabia. The Houthi-led popular uprising 
deposed one of the West's most important of puppets in the Middle East. And it seemed that Yemen was on the verge of becoming a truly independent and sovereign country, and one which would not dance to the tunes of the American and the British establishments. But catastrophe quickly struck. Before I go on to say what happened after Hadi fled Yemen for Saudi Arabia, it is important that I say a few words about him. In an unusual, to say the least, election in 2012, which saw sections of Yemen's population boycott the ballot, Hadi was the sole candidate and won 100% of the vote though voter turnout was only about 60% according to official figures. Some say the figure was lower. Upon taking office, Hadi moved quickly to place Yemen in the West's sphere of influence and also in the sphere of influence of both Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates two countries which the Americans and the British exert tremendous influence in, which is on the back of the British ruling elite's role in the creation of Saudi Arabia and the UAE. So, in essence, Hadi made Yemen subservient to the West, something which aroused great anger amongst the Yemeni people. Politically, economically, and militarily, Yemen was in the hands of the Americans and the British, who used their preponderant position in Yemen to firstly, strengthen their overall mastery in West Asia, secondly, increase their naval presence in the highly strategic Red, Sh Red Sea shipping lanes, thirdly, encourage anti-Iranian activities from, fourthly, take control of Yemen's oil and gas reserves, along with its pipelines, refineries, and liquefied natural gas terminals. Yemen holds 3 billion barrels of crude oil and 17 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. And fifthly, to exploit and plunder Yemeni natural resources for their own self gain as they have done in Kosovo and Matohia, Iraq and Libya, to name but a few. That Hadi was particularly in the hands of the British establishment was evidenced in part by how Britain was the first non-Arab country that he visited as president of Yemen, a visit which occurred in September of 2012. Hadi's visit to Britain was highly symbolic, yet the symbolism was lost on some observers at the time. Now, returning to March of 2015, when Hadi fled Yemen and when the Houthi movement, which is comprised of a political wing and, as I mentioned earlier, a political wing, a military wing, was preparing to form a government. The American and the British establishments looked on at a Houthi-run Yemen with fear, as they believed that Yemen would slip from their grip and that a truly independent and sovereign Yemen would look to pursue close relations with Iran. The Yemenis and the Iranians have enjoyed a good rapport with each other for over three decades now, and to also pursue close relations with Russia. South Yemen, or officially the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen, which existed in the period from 1967 to 1990, and was the only communist country to have existed in West Asia and the Arab world, enjoyed a, cro a close relationship with the Soviet Union. Not wanting to lose their grip on Yemen, the American and the British establishments in March of 2015, instructed Saudi Arabia and UAE to invade Yemen, destroy the Houthis, and reinstate Hadi as president. 
Washington and London informed Riyadh and Abu Dhabi that American and British weapons, training, spare parts, maintenance, intelligence, and logistics would be supplied in endless volumes to the Saudi and Emirati militaries for as long as the campaign would take to wrestle back control of Yemen for the Americans and the British. Furthermore, the Americans and the British informed the Saudis and the Emiratis that Western mainstream media would provide cover for the military campaign. Thus began a horrific war on a monumental level in which bombs, bullets, air and naval blockades, famine and disease have been used by the Saudis and the Emiratis and ultimately the Americans and the British against the Yemeni people in order to bring them to heel, to break them. According to the United Nations, America and Britain's war on Yemen has caused the deaths of 377,000 Yemeni men, women and children. And God only knows how many Yemeni civilians have been maimed. The atrocities which the American and British supported Saudi and Emirati air forces have committed in Yemen are both shocking and depraved. So, for instance, weddings and funerals have often been the target of bombing raids by Saudi and Emirati pilots. Furthermore, the US and UK supported Saudi and Emirati navies have imposed a naval blockade on Yemeni ports not controlled by Saudi and Emirati forces, which has resulted in large swathes of the Yemeni population being, uh, being unable to receive vital supplies such as food and medicine. In addition to that, evidence has come to light which demonstrates that the Americans and the British have provided training to the Saudis and the Emiratis on how to effectively enforce a naval blockade. After nine years of war, the Saudi and Emirati militaries, while illegally occupying a large amount of Yemen, have failed to defeat the Houthis and the Yemeni people as a whole. Much of Yemen's population resides in areas controlled by the Yemeni military and Houthi fighters, while the Saudis and the Emiratis control most of the areas in Yemen which are sparsely populated. And the losses in men and equipment, which the Saudi and the Emirati militaries have incurred in Yemen, are substantial, something which neither Riyadh, nor Abu Dhabi, nor London, nor Washington wish to talk about in public. Furthermore, Saudi and Emirati incompetence on the battlefield has attained epic proportions. Suffice to say that whilst the Saudis and the Emiratis have displayed a specialism for killing civilians, including children, their woeful ability to prosecute war against skilled and devoted fighters is clear for all to see. And had it not been for the endless military assistance provided by the Americans and the British, the Yemeni military and the Houthi fighters would have long ago expelled the Saudi and Emirati invaders from Yemeni soil. So, as it currently stands, there is a stalemate on the battlefield in Yemen. Washington and London understand all too well that they will not be able to break the will of the Yemeni people. And as for the Saudis, they are desperate to find a way out of the conflict, something which has caused friction in private between Riyadh on the one hand and Washington and London on the other hand. Regarding the Yemeni people, whilst it is true to say that they have all but defeated the endeavours of the Americans, the British, the Saudis and the Emiratis, they have paid for this with their blood. 
the Yemeni people do not pretend to be immune to grief. A whole generation of Yemenis has been lost, while many of those who are alive will carry the traumas of America and Britain's war against them to their graves. Lest we forget that millions of, Yemen of Yemenis are, to this day, not receiving vital supplies, including food and medicine, as a result of the US and UK supported Saudi and Emirati air and naval blockades. Thus, many Yemeni men, women and children continue to die agonizing deaths on a daily basis. That actuality leads to an inevitable question. Is genocide being carried out against the Yemeni people? I will leave that to you to consider. In the last week or so, a new dimension to the war against Yemen has emerged, namely Israel. Washington and London are telling their respective audiences in America and in Britain that they are now taking military action in Yemen because the Yemeni military and Houthi fighters are targeting with missiles Israeli, American and British vessels in the shipping lanes of the Red Sea. But, as usual, Washington and London are not providing the American and British publics with a truthful and complete version of events. Firstly, the American and the British ruling elites have not disclosed that they have been fighting a war in Yemen for the last nine years. And secondly, the American and the British elites have not said why the Yemeni military and Houthi fighters have targeted Israeli and Western vessels. In regard to the latter point, the Yemenis said that they have taken the action in response to the genocide which Israel is committing against the Palestinian people in Gaza. To date, the Israelis have murdered approximately 25,000 Palestinian civilians, of which roughly 12,000 are children. In commenting on the nine year war in Yemen, including its new dimension, Israel, one can say that a great deal of hate exists between, on the one hand, the Yemeni people, and on the other hand, the American, the British, the Saudi, and the Emirati elites. On a side note, how telling it is that Washington and London are prepared to use their militaries in Yemen, but not to defend America and Britain's borders against a tsunami of illegal immigrants comprised of military-aged men who are crossing the border on a daily basis. In the case of the former, the southern border with Mexico, and in the case of the latter, the English Channel. Only an idiot cannot see that the establishments in America and in Britain have plans for these illegal immigrants. Returning to Yemen, there is always two sides to a story. Indeed, there are often multiple sides to a story. That the American and the British establishments are not disclosing to their publics the full story concerning Yemen is indicative of people who are attempting to conceal something, which, as a matter of fact, is completely at odds with democratic principles. The message must be told that America and Britain have been at war in Yemen for nine years now, and not just for the last week or so. And I urge you to learn more about the American and British establishment's war against Yemen, the most brutal, horrific war in recent times. One final note. I said at the beginning of this talk that the American and the British ruling elites began bombing Yemen without the approval and without even consulting Congress or the Houses of Parliament, respectively. Well, 
That is not to say that if they had, and had Congress and the Houses of Parliament given their consent to bomb in Yemen, this would have made the action legal, because it would not have, not under international law. Only the United Nations Security Council can approve the use of military force being taken in the world. Further to that, even if the American and the British establishments had sought approval from their parliaments for bombing Yemen, I have no doubt at all that such support would have been forthcoming. Such is the self-seeking, amoral, soulless, spineless, moronic and corrupt nature of politicians in both America and Britain today. I have been commenting on America and Britain's war against Yemen since March of 2015. And if you would so like to, you can search my YouTube channel for what I have said on television and in speeches over the last nine years. As an example, I have posted in the comments section to this video, one of those speeches. As ever, Thank you for your attention.